struggle with the tendency when we speak about democratization on the continent of Africa that we tend to equate democracy with elections, as if elections are the panacea for democratic consolidation. Um, especially since elections can be incredibly divisive um, and, and there are questions around how they're financed. So I'm, I'm curious to know what you think the other units of analysis we might use besides elections uh, to measure democratic consolidation. The other is China aside. Um, also curious to know how you think international actors have in fact undermined the process of dem democratic um, con consolidation on the continent by either supporting authoritarian regimes for particular agendas or, or other ways in which um, international actors have undermined democratic consolidation. Elections are not uh, uh, necessarily the only issue for democracy. I certainly uh, agree with you. And uh, the other aspects will be uh, the rule of law, uh, certainly an independent uh, uh, judiciary is quite an important aspect of uh, uh, democratic uh, uh, consolidation. Uh, human rights, respect for uh, human rights uh, and uh, issues of uh, uh, good governance, uh, due process, all these are uh, basically uh, quite important. And uh, the example <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that we have uh, seen in in Ghana, uh, in many in many other places, uh, such a journalist uh, may not uh, uh, survive at all. Uh, he may actually uh, lose his life if you are doing that kind of uh, investigative uh, uh, journalism. So all this, the independent media, uh, to have an independent media that is not uh, uh, corrupt, uh, is uh, an important aspect because you can have. Uh, private sector media, uh, and uh, in order uh, to be covered uh, in any particular uh, article, even if you have a huge audience and you are giving a very, very good speech, uh, you are not covered, uh, the journalist has to be paid, and the person in the media house who decides which goes into the news uh, should also be paid. So an independent and competent uh, uh, media is quite an important uh, element of uh, democratic consolidation. I, I think there can be very many definitions for democracy because societies and the way they're constructed function differently. And and while you know uh, electoral elections allow for uh, a plurality of voices to be heard. As you say, sometimes they uh, engender much conflict than they should. But I don't think that there's anything wrong in elections because elections allow for ideas to be raised into the public forum. And it allows for people to challenge those ideas. Otherwise, it will be one voice that's in the public domain. So I think that it's we're, we're in a very turbulent time certainly for the continent in which we're challenging a lot of norms, we're challenging, we're trying to test our wings on what will work. And I think that it's important that the continent finds what works for it. But in finding what works for it, I think elections are a good measure, a good test of the people who are willing to step, uh, step up and put themselves out for public office and who are determined to whether for their own selfish interests or for altruistic interests, to serve the nation. And that's what you need in, in leadership, people who are willing to sacrifice for service. And if these people step up, whatever their motives, I think it's worth us celebrating and acknowledging. And if those ideas that they bring forth are offensive and, and you know, it, uh, we will have to repudiate them because at least they're sharing that in public rather than keeping them quiet. I think the first point has been well covered, so maybe just on the second point of international actors, I mean, it's amazing the divisions that exist even within individual countries. That's one of the things I try and do in the book, is I talk a little bit about you know, how many divisions there are within the international community, and when we talk about the West or the international community, we're really talking about multiple factions of interests. And you can see this even within one country. I mean, if you look at the USAID priorities, where USAID spends its money, and you can work at the state, you see that you're fighting against yourself effectively, right? I mean, I can I just found the page in the book. You can, these are the top um, military recipients of aid. This is back in 2007. Angola, Chad, the DRC, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Sudan. 
not a single democracy amongst them, right? Mm -hmm. So you're putting an awful lot of military money in the one hand to do certain things about security, and at the other hand, you're saying democracy is really important. Now, the argument is partly, and it's not a terrible argument, that what you need to do is you need to professionalize military, you need to professionalize these forces, because then they're less likely to go around committing human rights offenses. You and I, of course, um, are slightly more skeptical about the likelihood of better trained, better equipped, bigger militaries staying at home and doing the job that they're supposed to and not getting involved in politics and repression and marginalizing the opposition. So I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a very complicated process. Um, and even if we look quite recently at some of the things that have been going on, I mean, President Obama <coughs> went to Kenya and spoke in an arena in which people had been detained against their will in an anti-terror bus, right? And these were people who were basically rounded up because they didn't look right. And President Obama <coughs> did not speak out about that. Interestingly, President Obama spent a lot of time talking about homosexuality on that trip, <laughs> which doesn't matter that much, actually, in the scheme of Kenyan politics, right? I mean, I, everyone wants to stand up for gay rights, but in the moment that he was in, in Kenya, that was not the big issue. By focusing on that and not focusing on the denial of human rights to ethnic Somalis, he pulled his punches and talked about the issue that President Kenyatta actually was happy to stand on. And so I think in all of these little ways, we make compromises. But you also then have to be, you have to give credit to these guys because, of course, they're playing along a game. And if you put all of your punches in in the first round, people leave the ring, right? You're not invited back. You don't form partnerships. You don't get the ability to whisper in people's ear later down the line because you burn your bridges. So it's also true that you have to play a very delicate game, and we as outsiders who aren't actually playing this game have to be fair, that you have to, as an international actor or an international government or president, you have to make sure that you build ties that you can then use to influence people. And you may have to think about how far you can push people. You may only be able to push people 10% every year. And from the outside, that may look like selling out, it may look like pushing too slowly. But from the inside, it may look like all that's achievable without getting nothing. And so I agree with your point, but I think we also need to be reflective about what's achievable. You've concentrated uh, uh, quite a lot on formal national institutions, elections, and how the international community can engage with them, strengthen them. I wonder about some of the less formal structures that can either be forms of power within countries that impede democracy and impede good governance, but those also that can actually improve, improve accountability, particularly indigenous forms, and very much taking your point of view, Nick, that there are many different democracies, many different histories. I just wondered, bearing that in mind, what do you think, for example, of what has happened in Somaliland, the country that no one recognizes, but has actually, and here I rely on the opinion of a colleague of Vera's and an old colleague of mine, Mary Harper, who knows Somalia and Somaliland very well, that actually they've managed, because of no foreign interference, no reliance on foreign aid, no foreign pressure, to actually begin to build something that is indigenous, accountable, and perhaps democratic, but not reliant perhaps on Western approval. And then in Botswana, where you still have the Hotla system that is informal, but it does have an influence. And I just wonder your views about those issues. If I can just chip in behind you, sitting Michael Walls as well, who has uh, not only been on the, um, uh, led the election monitoring uh, commission in, in Somaliland, but has written extensively about it as well, including an ARI publication. So this is a plug for ARI and Michael together uh, about the nature of democracy and uh, informal institutions in the Somali Horn in general. I can't claim to be an expert on the whole of, uh, of Africa or Somalia, but uh, or Somalia or Somaliland. But um, well, the two, we're watching actually those two countries because I think they set up an electoral commission preparing for elections in 2017. And I met a former colleague who uh, this week actually, and they were saying that they're preparing for local elections uh, next year. Somaliland is an interesting. One, because they have ostensibly, correct me if I'm wrong, the same sort of uh, social structure as Somalia, clan-based system, 
with large powers uh, from the clans, but also have a central government that operates in a sort of, in a, uh, I think in a joint manner, if, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong. Does the clan system, I mean, let me use uh, a country I know well, Ghana as an example, where the traditional authorities um, do not have a formal place in the uh, political structure, which are the traditional uh, houses of chiefs and kings, but are seen as very critical to the political stability and actually dissemination of political information or, and organizing of um, the political systems in a country. So they have been given a, an honorary role of the Council of State where they serve as an advisory body to the government. Locally, however, when it comes to party politics, even though they're not meant to be political, every single political party ensures that if they do turn up to campaign, they make sure the chiefs have the front row of their campaigns. And all the chiefs appear. So that independence, that, um, uh, that seeming sort of, uh, yeah, that, that independence and that infallibility is, I think, um, obliterated by the association, whether it's with one party or the other, and, and whether it's and whether it's also sort of trying to be even-handed to both, because invariably a lot of the political parties have, for historical reasons, been formed on regional bases, which have got tribal links, which have got ethnic links towards them. So, however much you know, the king of Ashanti will want to be an independent arbiter in the political process in Ghana. You can't get away from the figures that come from the Ashanti region of Ghana that says that 80% of the votes would go to the opposition NPP government or the NPP party. You can't run away from the fact that in the Volta region of Ghana, 80-70% of the vote will go to the ruling NDC because of the links of that, those, that party, because of the traditional uh, links and ethnic links they have with the party. So. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but to some extent, I think that depending on how those traditional processes, th those traditional systems have been used in the past, how they've evolved uh, politically, and how they have, and, and what regions they represent, they can either be a supporter for you know democratizing, or they could be just a, a you know. Window dressing. Well, in in case of uh, of uh, Tanzania, the, uh, the the exercise of uh, building national unity. One of mm -hmm. our disadvantages is that uh, we have managed that one, but also we have uh, basically eradicated in many ways uh, the uh, traditional uh, systems of uh, of power. Uh, the chiefdoms are no longer really uh, that quite uh, that is strong. Uh, also, uh, we have a problem in the sense that uh, uh, we do not allow uh, uh, independent uh, candidates. So everything seemed to be structured the way the ruling party made it was that uh, uh, in order to have stability within uh, the party, uh, they said that we should not have uh, independent candidates. The new constitution does allow. Uh, to have uh, the draft, which has not been passed, the <laughs> constitution does allow to have uh, uh, independent candidates. But uh, please excuse me just briefly to return to the uh, uh, question of the uh, <laughs> honorable uh, 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 ambassador. Uh, for, for, for the <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, just very, very briefly. You see, because the, the process, uh, every observer in Zanzibar, local and foreign, commended the process. Of, uh, of the elections. The counting was done at the polling stations, the addition at the constituency. And uh, the results which uh, the candidate announced, he was receiving reports from the polling agents that these are the results signed by the uh, returning officer in that particular uh, polling area. So to say that, well, from the results I've received from the agents, I've won these elections. And now people were allowing, even for casters, polling, people were polling, to say who is going to win. Then it becomes a problem once you have received certified, signed 
documents that these are the results from each constituency to say that when I add these results for these 54 constituencies, the results are that uh, I have uh, received uh, uh, 207, 207,000 votes, 847, and the CCM candidate has received 182,011. And why did he announce in 1995? We had the results. He didn't announce. And then the Electoral Commission announced, changed the results. So this time around to preempt <laughs> what happened. <laughs> what happened in 1995? He said that, well, it's well and good to lay the results as signed by the retailing officers in each particular constituency. And if that is uh, and if that is wrong, you take him to court. You don't cancel the elections. Simple. That is. Thank you. Can I just it's a very, this is a very contentious, uh, uh, very uh, temporary, very important issue. Yes. You know, nobody is uh, denying that. But if we could just stare on and, and the discussion can can you know continue afterwards because I do realise there are there are plenty of people with, with, with strong views. And yes I, 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 I am. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm uh, taking chair's prerogative to just co opt Michael Walls as well to to, to to say something about indigenous institutions in, in the Somali form um, uh, in, in response to your to your question. Sure. Thank you. Um, I, mean, I guess it connects with Roxel's question about international involvement as well. Um, I think it's dangerous to say that Somaliland is what it is because it didn't get any outside support or interference. It, it's important that it didn't at a particular moment in time. Um, and Somalia is a case of the opposite, that it got a lot of support at the wrong moment of time and a lot of financial input. Um, but the reality is much more complicated than that. Um, actually, there's a lot happening in Somaliland at the moment which really needs international um, support. Often it needs it in a rather difficult, sort of deeply embedded um, process of, of pushing, arguing, supporting, and so on. And the same in the South. I mean, it's, it's perhaps it's not relevant, but <coughs> as I've been tweeting from this event, I've, over the last few hours I've been seeing news from Somalia that they've just signed an agreement, just made an agreement uh, that they will institute a new upper house and they've come to a terms about how they're going to elect the next parliament, upper and lower house, which is a significant um, shift. And it, I think in a way in the South, the international community is getting a little bit better at doing what it's doing, but it still has a huge di distance to go. In Somaliland, we're also getting a little bit better at gauging our in, in involvement. And there have been a few successes where the international community has really been instrumental in making things move forward in a constructive way. So I think we have to be careful about, about saying it's because there wasn't international involvement that Somaliland's good, and it's because there was that Somalia is bad. I kind of cautiously agree with that in a way, but I think we've got to be really careful about the way we put that. Um, that wasn't about indigenous indigen institutions at all, but I can go on about that. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Michael. No, I think I mean, that's partly what I was going to say. And it's true that Somaliland has held the best elections ever held in the Horn, but it's also true that there have been very rough patches recently as well. So, I mean, it merges a sort of US style checks and balances system with a sort of clan based representation system. So it has elements that you could say, in a sense, reflect international best practice, although they weren't <coughs> developed in the same way, um, and elements that come out of society. I think there's a, there's a great work done on this by Bradbury and others about you know, the way in which you know, communal mechanisms for resolving conflict and dealing with injustices and crime were used to build a broader societal understanding of how you might put together a political system. And I think there is, you know, there's a serious way in which we can learn from that about the way that Somaliland got itself off the ground. And almost the opposite is happening in Somalia, where we have, you know, as Michael was saying, a very top-down kind of process of constitution making. Um, you know, in Somaliland, there was much more of a process of a gathering of important figures. In Somalia, we're not even going to have a referendum to get this constitution through. So it's been made to look like it's Somali-owned by a media campaign by international organizations in the absence of mass public participation. The chances of success in that context are pretty limited. 
But on traditional leaders more generally, we published a piece in African Affairs, which was fascinating, by Carolyn Logan from Michigan State University. And what the piece basically shows is that you know, traditional leaders are one of the most legitimate institutions in Africa, and they are one of the few institutions that Africans want to have more power. It is not true of the police, it is not true of border forces, it is not true of most MPs, but it is true of traditional leaders. So there is a, tr a great deal of legitimacy there. And it's particularly around local issues and around conflict resolution and around land issues. All of which is great, so you think, fantastic, let's harness the power of traditional leaders. And there's no reason to think that doing so necessarily undermines democracy, right? We have a house of lords. No one comes along and tells us we're not democratic. The Americans have an electoral college. No one goes and tells them they're not democratic. We might, well, let me clarify, we might think of these things as being things that we individually would like to improve. We might want to get rid of the house of lords and have a directly elected, elected second chamber. But we don't think that that's prevented us from consolidating a pretty good political system over time, right? So there's no reason to think that actually building in indigenous elements of political practice would undermine Africa's long-term democratic trajectory. But we do have to be very careful. We know that traditional leaders are very bad at protecting the rights of women, particularly the rights of women to inherit land. We know that traditional leaders in general in Africa are men. We know that the way that they distribute power is often very problematic. And we know that they can often trigger conflicts as well as reducing conflicts. Mm -hmm. So the argument I try to run in the book is that we should be harnessing this more, but it's got to go hand in hand with a reform of the institution. We can't simply take the institution as it is and stick it in the heart of the political system and expect it to deliver. We've got to ask the institution itself to reform a little bit at the same time. But there is a really big problem here, and I think Vera's comment was excellent and really insightful, that you've got to be really careful about what these traditional leaders are doing and who they're doing it for. Because we assume that these guys are indigenous, right? But in many cases, we know that they were in part created by colonial rule. So then you've got to start asking how African really are they. And then you've got to ask who pays their wages. And the vast majority of traditional leaders in Africa are paid by the ruling party. Mm -hmm. right? And if you ask opposition leaders in most African countries, I went on a tour once, I went to six different countries, I asked people in every one, what is the number one fear, the problem you have in mobilizing support in your area? The traditional leader is in the pay of the ruling party. He gets a vehicle, he gets an allowance, and he uses that to mobilize support. And he tells people that if we don't vote for the ruling party, all of these bad things will happen unto us. And so I can't get more than 30% of it. So, yes, on the one hand, you want to harness them, but on the other hand, they are really the rural bedrock of ruling party support that is keeping many parties in power. That's why I seize on the Hopler system, though, mm. where there is the opportunity for people to express opinion, and they do, and I, I do agree with your point, even in the Hopler system, women don't have yeah. a strong voice. As they Hopler, are not encouraged. As Hopler was saying, one of the problems with many of the more indigenous systems is that yes. it's traditionally elder, more wealthy men who dominate the debate. But of course, if we flip that round and look at the US presidential debate, <laughs> 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 in terms of media, in terms of media, in, especially in Africa, one of the observations I'm going to put across is the importance of media to be an agenda setter. An agenda setter, which means you shape the debates. You can even influence politics by um, educating the masses, informing them. So that key part of agenda setter, you know, from the media. Um, I didn't want to hear you talk about, but I thought it was important. Second point. Second point, I'm talking about transformative leadership, which has been the key lacking ingredient uh, or the, the key thing that is hindering democracy. Transformative le leadership in terms of when you come to Africa, wherever you go, east, west, south, north, you, you find that we lack leaders who can transform societies. I'm saying so because in Africa we have brilliant constitutions. Kenya just came up with the most progressive constitution not long ago, 2010. But the problem we have right now, the things that have gone wrong, is not because we didn't have a constitution of the law. Uh, chapter 6 of the constitution, if that was used the way it was in the constitution, you wouldn't have any candidates vying for president who are candidates to the ICC, you wouldn't have that. But we had that. Now we are talking about, I spent time covering the chicken gate scandal for Kenya, you know, touching on the bribing of the electoral commission in Kenya. I was right inside the court when I saw 
you know, the, the givers of the bride being sentenced. But those who are given, up to date, they are working scot free. We are going to election again, 2017. They are still working scot free. They are the ones to be the ones to regulate or who foresee that election. Mm -hmm. Thanks. What does that say to you? Thank you very much. Well, just briefly, I, I think it's uh, important that a constitution or new constitution is not a panacea of solving uh, our problems. It is uh, the issue of uh, uh, implementing those constitutions. And uh, I was optimistic that if you have an involvement of the population in the constitutional making, uh, probably you have a better chance of actually having a constitution that will be implemented. Uh, uh, but the experience in Kenya, as you have pointed out, uh, uh, does not necessarily uh, guarantee that uh, uh, people participating in the popular constitution will actually be uh, be implemented. And therefore it is important for all of us uh, uh, to fight for uh, this transformation and uh, to have uh, uh, the constitution actually being implemented. Not just a, a good constitution uh, in, uh, in a book, but uh, a constitution that is actually acted upon by everyone in society. I, I can't tell you how often how I'm frustrated by the number of times you listen to breakfast shows, which are the biggest um, radio listener um, events on the continent, and you always have a politician on the program talking about what some other politician said. And it's always about he said, she said, and none of it is about explaining what the implications are for the people. And that's, for me, incredibly frustrating. And going into an election season in Ghana is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Just a quick point on the Constitution. The Constitution, it is a good Constitution, and bits of the Constitution are implemented. Another thing that you didn't mention was the gender clause, which wasn't implemented mm -hmm. because the Supreme Court, in a non-unanimous decision, a majority decision, decided that it wasn't going to be possible to implement it in time. But I think you're a little bit pessimistic as well. I mean, there are loads of great things that happen as a result of that constitution that's still there. You know, we have 47 directly elected governors. As a result of that in Kenya, opposition parties that have never won power nationally are now in charge of Nairobi and Mombasa, two of the most important <coughs> counties. That's a really significant development. Although most of us think that the central government, if it could, would roll back decentralization, yeah. the local popularity of it means that they're not actually able to do so. That's a major gain for Kenya. It's a gain to spread corruption and patronage in new ways, but it's a gain in terms of the number of people who are in the state in the system. And sometimes you have to play a trade-off, right? So if we've increased the amount of corruption and patronage in Kenya by 10%, but we've done it by spreading it into every single county and by giving lots of new communities a stake in the system, is that a bad thing or a good thing? Maybe the thing that stops Kenya's political system imploding in violence at the next election. I would say it may be something that's worth working with. But there's another thing that happened out of that constitution, which is really transformative if it's followed through. And that is, and as you will know, the constitution in two or three key pair areas specifies the need for public participation in policy making. The first time this has been done, I think, in an African constitution. And the Kiambu County Council was taken to court by civil society groups who said that the governor, in making policy, had only participated of a small business elite in a hotel. And the court, ruled that the Kiambu County budget was illegal and threw it out because it had not had participation with poorer groups within society. Now that really transformed. As, as we speak, counties all over Kenya are drafting um, guideline legislation on public participation to guide their budget processes in future as a result of the Kiambu ruling. That's come about because of the ability of an active civil society to take a constitutional provision to a good judge and make the right decision. So don't be too pessimistic about the constitution. Right? There are bad bits, there are things that aren't being implemented, there are also things that are being implemented. And if people keep fighting on those, you may gain real success. Just very quickly on the media and leadership. I think it's great to talk about media leadership and the need for great people who are going to you know, write brilliant stories, but we have to put that in the context of the structure of the media in Africa. I'm very lucky that I wrote a column for the Saturday Nation, Sunday Nation in Kenya, and I get to do it from a job where I don't rely on that for my income, and in the safety of living in the UK. So I can write pretty much what I want. My colleagues in Nairobi will typically be living in a country where if they write a more controversial story, there'll be a phone call from the State House to the editors of the newspaper about maybe spiking that story. If the story spiked, they don't get paid. 
they rely on the salary of stories because the vast majority of journalists are not on central contracts, they're stringers. Right? So you've got a system where people are relying on getting stuff into the newspapers in order to get paid. If you have a system like that with relatively few people on core staffs, with relatively few people actually paid to do investigative journalism, then asking those people to risk their lives and their livelihoods by publishing stories that are exposés of corruption or electoral fraud is a really big ask. Right? They're not doing it from the nice position of the Washington Post exposing, you know, exposing Nixon. They're doing it from a position of very little institutional support, very little financial security, right? and judiciaries that aren't necessarily going to back them up. So I think it's great to ask for and look for great leadership. And we've seen it all across Africa. We've seen incredibly brave journalists who risk their lives to publish important stories. But we've also got to be realistic about what is possible within those media structures. And one of the things that I think needs to happen if we really want to see an independent, exciting, progressive, investigative journalism is we have to see journalists paid more on permanent contracts and actually given jobs and tasks where they have the capacity. Most people I know in Africa who are journalists don't have more than one or two days to write a story. You can't uncover in-depth government <laughs> corruption in that period of time. So it requires both a change in the way that journalism is structured as well as the rise of those leaders. And my bet would be that if you structured the media differently, those people would find it much easier to rise to the top.